we've been asking the question, has God spoken? as we're going through a series looking at evidence for the Bible. And we'll be looking at a whole bunch of different things. Uh, the, the first one that we're looking at is prophecy to show that God has spoken. So this is the issue of prophecy. This is really the fingerprint of God. I mean, information that could not have just come from the mind of man. At least no reasonable person thinks that this comes from the mind of man. Um, two weeks ago, we looked at the false prophecies from Jehovah's Witnesses. We looked at them from uh, Mormon uh, sources, actually specifically Joseph Smith, the prophet, original prophet and founder of Mormonism. We looked at their false prophecies because I wanted to show the contrast of biblical prophecy to fake prophecies so that hopefully it hits home. Wow, this is impressive, you know, because sometimes we, we see what's, what's amazing and we don't recognize the value of what we're looking at. Uh, last week, we looked at Ezekiel 26 and the destruction of Tyre, the city of Tyre, and how Alexander the Great fulfilled, like in, in neat detail exactly what was stated about casting the city into the ocean and all this kind of neat stuff. Um, this week, we're going to look at some prophecies in Daniel. We'll be in Daniel probably next week as well. But we're going to look at Daniel 7 and we're going to look at Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 7 and 8 and some specific prophecies that Daniel made about future kingdoms that were coming. So let's, uh, let's just read Daniel chapter 7 verse 1. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now, we're interested in these four beasts. These four beasts are the subject of the prophecy. The first one, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. So this is the first two beasts. And then in verse six, after this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So there's these consecutive beasts. What is dominion? dominion is like when you are dominating and I am, I am in charge. I am in control. So this beast is told you're the boss. You're the new boss. And all three of these beasts are bosses one after another. They're very boss, as it were. <laughs> First, now, if I, I'm going to skip forward. There's a, there's a fourth beast, but we're not going to focus on that because that's a future prophecy, not yet fulfilled. We're focusing on fulfilled prophecy here. So in verse 15, there is interpretation given, more details about these beasts. So I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I, I came near to one of those who stood by me and asked him the truth of all this. So in this vision, in this dream, he, he sees what ends up being probably an angel, right? So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So what does it mean? Because just by itself, that's probably not enough data. But here we have the interpretation given. So you, it's unmistakable what this is about. Verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And that's talking about the, the later part of the prophecy, not yet fulfilled, so we're not focusing on that. So there are four kings. That's the interpretation key. That's the important thing. We're told ahead of time, these are four kings. So let's look at these four beasts, knowing that they're four kings. The first beast was like a lion. <laughs> Forgive my Photoshop skills, which I lack, with eagle's wings. <laughs> Uh, it was like a lion and it had eagle's wings, but then the wings were plucked. And then it was made to stand like a man. Ta-da. And it was given a heart like a man. It was given a man's heart. Now that word can be translated heart or mind. Uh, they looked at that, the heart, as also a, a place of, of thought as well. So, so the heart or the mind, it's given this of a man. Now this line, now that's, that's the details. Now let's look at the interpretation. We know it's four kings. This lion is clearly to us Nebuchadnezzar, uh, contemporary with Daniel. Daniel knew Nebuchadnezzar. He, he uh, worked with him in his kingdom. 
or for him, really. And this lion is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He's actually referred to as a lion by name in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7, in Ezekiel 17, 3. So you have other prophets who referred to Nebuchadnezzar as a lion. Lions were, were common in Babylonian art. In fact, the Ishtar Gate, which Nebuchadnezzar built, here's a picture of it as they uncovered it, um, actually had lions on it. Lions were also um, on the walls of the city, and there was a trail of lions heading from the Ishtar Gate into one of the temples of the city. Lions were also found on the palace walls. So a lion for Nebuchadnezzar seems very appropriate. The wings represent majesty and dominance. They're actually specifically the wings of an eagle. So you've got the lion, the king of the beasts, and the wings of an eagle, the king of the birds. So you've got the king. And Nebuchadnezzar had this massive world empire. And it was really, in a lot of ways, it was the first of its kind. He was, he's even, some people call him the first world ruler. And you're like, world ruler? Well, yes, of the, of the human occupied known world at the time, this was pretty much, this was it. Um, it, was, it was massive. He was the, the lion. I can sit down wherever I want, stand up wherever I want, do what I want. I'm the king. But the prophecy says that his wings are plucked. Well, they are plucked, and then he is made to stand like a man, and he's given a man's heart, which could also, like I said, be translated uh, a man's mind. Now, this is actually recorded, this event is recorded in Daniel chapter 4. If you go to Daniel 4, some of you know the story. Nebuchadnezzar was exalted with arrogance and pride. He's like, look at this great Babylon which I have built. Look at this awesome nation that I run. I am awesome, basically, is the, the short version of his long speech about how great he is. And then God says, no. And he is brought low. In fact, he becomes mad. He becomes crazy. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar is basically wandering around, crazy, still technically the king, but he's not really accomplishing much, so they're probably just kind of like pandering to him like, like some nations have done when they've had a crazy monarch. And <laughs> they're just like, just keep him happy, you know? And so he's like this for seven years. His hair grows out long. His nails grow out like claws. I mean, he's just, it's like he's a beast. And then it clicks. And he suddenly comes to his senses and he realizes God is great. It's not me. And because he's lost everything, he's had everything and lost everything, he sees how futile it all is. And then he gains what? A man's heart, wisdom. He gets set upright. So he's, he's like a man. He's no longer just like this ferocious lion dominating the world, but rather he's, he's like a man. So now you might say, Mike, that's not prophecy. And you're right. That's not really prophecy because these, these things happen contemporary to Daniel. He lived with Nebuchadnezzar. So he experienced him. He, uh, he talked with him. He watched this descend into madness. In fact, he was there even when Nebuchadnezzar was gone and the next king came in. So that's not prophecy, but you know what it is. It's a pattern of interpretation that we will follow as we look at the other kings. So we're given one that's really easy to figure out, the lion, very easy to figure out within the context of Daniel. So that as we look at the other beasts, we can click and go, okay, it's going to be this type of thing. It's going to follow this pattern. So let's look now at the second beast. The second beast was a bear. The bear actually is the, the next empire, the next kingdom to come take over after Babylon. Not long after Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon is conquered by the Medo-Persian empire. Now, they had a good, long, strong empire from 539 to 331 BC. And they take over the Babylonian uh, empire. Now, now they're in control. Now they're in charge. You may have heard of a guy named Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great was the founder of the Persian or Medo-Persian empire. It actually, um, it started out a certain way. See, uh, Medea, this land, they were dominant, and Persia was just sort of a satellite or, a, or a, a region within Medea. They were in charge. The Medes are the empire in control. The Persians are subjective to them. When Cyrus comes into power, he actually takes over their empire, ousts their king, and becomes the king of the Medes and the Persians. And then they sort of switch roles, one becoming subjective to the other. So they, this, this is the bear raised up on one side. Now, Daniel 8 is going to verify this information because it will give us more details. But the bear is raised up on one side. That's one of the details of it. Remember, Medea was the overlord of the Persians. Cyrus came in. He flipped things. He took over the Persians, slowly rose to power. In 546, he took the capital of Medea, 
and he declared himself the king. In fact, three years later, when he was able to give himself this official title, he declared himself the king of the Persians. So he had the Persian, the, and we call it now the Medo-Persian Empire, but it went like this. Here's the Medes, here's the Persians, as they're under the Medes, and then there's still one empire, but the Persians take over. And later on, the Persians speak of the Medes as like second-class citizens. So this is the Medo-Persian Empire, this is the bear. Now the bear seems to represent their sort of style of doing things. They sort of the lumbering, just almost clumsily just wrecking everything in their way, and that's kind of how the Persians did it. The bear has three ribs in its mouth. Hey, <laughs> Bible teacher, not tech guy so much, but <clears throat> yes, it's three ribs in its mouth. And th the number three, well, this probably represents the three major nations that the Medo-Persian Empire took over, which was Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. And there are three major nations that they actually conquered and took over, establishing their empire beyond just the walls of uh, Persia. It was told, arise, devour much flesh. This phrase, arise, devour much flesh, I think is saying, okay, we had the king, we have the Babylonians, the lion, and then now we have the bear, now it's your turn. Arise, now it's your turn, take over. So he's got those, uh, those ribs, those are the three countries that he took over. And then we get to the third beast, the third beast. The third beast was a leopard with four wings. This was actually someone else did this, but <clears throat> I took it. And the leopard is the next major world empire. These are consecutive world empires. There was nobody in between that was the world empire. It was just went from Babylon, Medo-Persia, into Alexander the Great's empire, the Greek empire, Macedonian Greek empire, um, 336 to about 323. And that's not just, that's, that we're looking at his time of ruling specifically. That's how long Alexander the Great ruled. He came in power when he was 20 years old and he controlled the empire, he expanded it, and he took over very quickly, very, very quickly. He conquered his entire empire in just that period from 20 years old till he was 33 in 13 years. Keep in mind, Nebuchadnezzar sieged Tyre for 13 years, one city. Alexander conquered his whole empire in that time. And a lot of it, um, towards the latter end, he just blasted through and spent the majority of the time just consolidating Greece before he moved on. So this is the idea. Okay, now you're next. You've got four wings. That speaks of speed, just like the creature, the leopard, speaks of speed. It's all about speed. It's all about how fast he does it. Not like the lion, not like the bear. No, he's phew, just zooms out there and takes over. That was what was remarkable about Alexander the Great. That's why we call him great, is because he was so fast at what he did. He's Muhammad Ali of the ancient world, sort of. Now, we read about what this guy did to the city of Tyre. It took about seven months for him to accomplish his siege and destruction of the city of Tyre, build that causeway. You might get the impression that he did this sort of thing everywhere he went, but actually what happened is people just bowed down and gave in, especially after hearing about the stuff that he was doing in Tyre. They just yielded. He went from Tyre down to Egypt and just took it over. He went out to the east and just took over. He was known for marching his troops for days on end so that the enemies couldn't consolidate their land and get ready for war. He was just like, I'm going to get over there before you're ready for me. He would chase the enemy and he wouldn't let his troops rest. And he kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And so this is what he's known for is his speed. It's what he did. There were four heads on this beast. Well, Alexander the Great's empire, after, after he died, was given to four different generals. Four different generals. And these four men took over and split the empire into four pieces. And so this actually, now, now all this is fairly impressive. I think it's really interesting, right? I mean, it really ties legitimately to actual history. But as we continue and we get into Daniel 8, we're going to see that there's way more details. And those 7 and 8, when you put them together, comprise this really detailed account of ancient history. So we're talking way past the time of Daniel, way past the time of Nebuchadnezzar, that this stuff happens. Dominion is given over to him. So again, we have the first empire, the second, the third, and now another phrase that refers to he's in control now. Now, this is um, uh, the fourth beast. We're going to skip because that's future prophecy. Again, it's really interesting, but it's not the subject for tonight. Daniel's second vision, Daniel 8. We're going to spend the rest of our time tonight in Daniel chapter 8. 
He has another vision in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. A vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan in the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram. He's going to see two creatures this time. A ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Now that's pretty much the major chunk of the vision there, but then we're, we begin to get the interpretation of this later on in the chapter, so I'm going to skip forward to that in verse 20. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Medea and Persia. Specifically named. Specifically named. So the ram, we already know who this is. In fact, this corresponds to, to who, what animal was it in the last vision? The bear. So now we have a ram, the bear that was lifted up on one side. Now we have a ram that has two horns and one's higher than the other, but it came up last. These are the kings of Medea and, per and Persia. Medea was already uh, very big at the time of this prophecy and was in the process of joining with Persia when Daniel was alive. It was just in that process of happening. Um, Persia was relatively small. <clears throat> Here's the ram. One horn's higher than the other, pretty much. So which, I go with it, man. Just go with it. The ram was the Medo-Persian uh, empire from uh, 539 to 330 BC. That's, that's the timeline of this empire. Again, there are two horns. The two horns are Medea and Persia. Medea and Persia. One of the horns came up last. That's Persia. Medea was in power first, Persia was a client state, and then it rose to power and actually ended up becoming the namesake of the Persian Empire later on is what it ends up being called. So it's higher, which means it's higher in prestige. It's above the other. The horns will represent kings and represent authorities, and so the authority of one is higher than the other. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Now as we continue, and as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. It's going so fast. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. Both those horns, Medea, Persia, they're both broken by this. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. We're also given an interpretation of what we just read here. So let's skip forward. Daniel 8, verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. It's the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Now this is detailed explanation, so you can't mistake it. It's the kingdom of Greece. It's the Medes and Persians. There'll be this power thing that happens between the Medo-Persian Empire. Then the Greeks are going to come in, destroy and take over the Medo-Persian kingdom. And it's going to be, this, this horn's going to be the first king, whoever's considered the first king of this new empire. They're going to do this. Pretty, uh, pretty specific here. The goat represents, again, the Greeks. They began their empire in 336. I didn't put an end date because it kind of depends on how you count it. <laughs> Did it end at Alexander's death? Do you continue counting when the empire splits? But, but right about that time, 336, that's when he comes in and takes over. Here's an actual coin from ancient Macedonia that has a goat on it because the goat was tied with Macedonia. See, Alexander wasn't just a Greek. He became the king of the Macedonians. And then he helped consolidate the Greeks and then move forward as the Greek ruler to take over Egypt and Tyre, of course, we learned that, Palestine, move into Persia and all that. He was a Macedonian. They were symbolized by goats. In fact, his son 
was named Alexander Agus, which means goat or son of the goat. Interestingly, a good name, right? <laughs> the first Macedonian king that they ever had was said in legend to be aided by goats. And so, you know, Macedonia and goats go together. So he's, it's appropriate that the Greeks are connected with goats here in this, in this vision. The one horn that it has, this single horn is a specific ruler. That ruler is Alexander the Great. He was really the first king of this empire. He established the empire. The goat is said to fly, fly without touching the ground from the west, which is, if you can put your Mediterranean map in your brain, they would be in the west compared to Israel and compared to Persia. They're flying from the west to come and take over and destroy the Persian empire. It's said that they ran, that this goat will run right over the ram, just destroy the ram, just wreck, break the horns, and the ram will have no power to resist. And this is exactly what happened. In about three years, he conquers Persia. What? Yeah, it just, boom, you're mine. About as much time as it takes for his troops to march across this place. It just runs right over and goes straight through and breaks the horns and takes over their power. And it says in the prophecy that when this king is strong, when he becomes strong, he'll be broken. Alexander, from 20 till he was about 32 years old, he ruled over the Greeks and built this amazing empire, this massive empire. And then died very quickly of malaria or something like that. So there's debates about how exactly he died. Probably malaria. He was 32 years old, and it was June 13th, 323 BC. He had plans to invade Rome and Carthage. He was planning on moving forward and just expanding his kingdom and keeping it, keeping it going. When he was dying, they asked him, Alexander, who do you leave your kingdom to? He's there on his deathbed. And Alexander, he was kind of a jerk, okay? He was not, he was not a good guy. He was not someone you want to hang out with. He was successful at killing people and taking their land, <laughs> pretty much. But he says to them, to, in response to the question, who will you leave your kingdom to? Alexander says, to the strong, and dies. You can imagine this did not create the most stable environment for the people trying to take over after he left. And so it ends up being that after Alexander, the, the horn is broken after he dies, that his kingdom is split into four pieces, like we said with the leopard, the four heads. Those four notable horns that come up are the four separate kingdoms that come out of his initial empire that didn't last, as, it, as itself, didn't last beyond his death very much. He says, to the strong. Well, the strong ended up being four generals. These four generals split up his empire into four pieces. Cassander, he ended up getting Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus, he got Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor. And Seleucus got Syria and the area east of Syria, including Babylon, we call his the Seleucid Empire, and that actually lasted longer than the other two. And then another one that lasted longer was Ptolemy. You just ignore the P. Ptolemy, all right? Now, Ptolemy, well, you can say that if you feel like it. Um, Ptolemy got Egypt and probably Palestine, Arabia, and Petraea. And so we've got, they're taking over. You see basically the orange and the purple are the two we're going to be most concerned about because the other two didn't really stick around for too long. But these are the four generals. I mean, think about the, the, the exactness of this prophecy. There'll be kings. They'll come from this area. They're going to take over. It'll be like this type of warfare that's going to happen. Then as soon as he gets strong, as soon as he got to his height of his power, he like went through a little pause. He was going around consolidating his power, and then he dies. And what? It's split into four. This is, this is exactly as it was prophesied in Daniel. But let's read on. There's more. In Daniel 8, verse 9, it says, And out of one of them, remember there's four horns that come up out of that one horn. So we're still talking about the goat. We're still talking about the Greek empire split up into these four. Out of one of them, one of those four, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. We will go back over all this. So we're just going to read it and then it gets it in your mind. 
because it's a lot to take in <laughs> all at once. And this is the end. We're going to talk about this little horn, and that's it for tonight. So hang in there. You're doing good. Verse 9, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, um, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So the sanctuary is referring to the temple, the Jews' temple. It'll be uh, defiled, and then it'll be cleansed. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the trans... This is... Uh, now we're moving... Up, if you notice, we're in uh, verse 14 at the end of this uh, slide, and then we're moving into verse 23. So we're, we're looking forward again. He gets an interpretation. He gets a little bit more data. So we're skipping to that part. Daniel 8, 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise. This is the little horn, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. We're getting the, uh, the style of this king. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. That would be who? Yeah, we're talking about the Jewish people here, right? This is the host we're talking about. These are the people that he's coming against. So this prophecy is specifically about a persecutor of the Jews. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, God, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true, therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. That vision of evenings and mornings is the 2300 days. In the Hebrew, it says 2300 evenings and mornings. We translate it as days. Um, so maybe re re referencing Genesis, where it, we read uh, is evening and morning, and then the first day evening and morning, second day. <clears throat> Maybe a reference to that, or it could be a reference to the, to the um, sacrifices at the temple, because they had sacrifices in the evening and in the morning. But anyways, there's 2,300 of them. Okay, now uh, let's take a breath. We're going to look at how this prophecy was fulfilled in the life of one horrible individual named Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV is his real name. He gave himself the name Epiphanes. He lived... About 215 to 164 BC, we know his death time, 164 for sure, 215 is the guess of when he was born. He was a king of the Seleucid Empire. So Alexander the Great's empire broke into four pieces to the west, uh, excuse me, you're on your side it'll be, okay, so I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to help you but it hurt. Okay, so in the east you had the Persians, that area that was taken over by Alexander became the Seleucid Empire, General Seleucus took it over. His, one of his, um, not, not a descendant necessarily who deserved the throne, but one of his descendants came and took over. He arose from the Seleucid horn, is what I'm saying. And we have that in verse 9, where it said, Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Toward the south, that's Egypt. Um, and Antiochus, or Antiochus, depending on how you want to pronounce it, doesn't matter to me. This guy was the first of his Seleucids to actually take over Egypt. He actually successfully conquered Egypt, and that was kind of a big deal. Um, he mainly did it so he could rob them, because that was his big thing. Wherever he went, he took your money. <laughs> he was all into plundering. He was into plundering and financing whatever else he had going on, other things. He also was powerful, that's to the south, to the east, and so um, that would be in the land where he... Um, he actually starts out, he's powerful in his own land, and also even extending his borders and fighting people on that side, on the east, and also the glorious land. Now, the glorious land would be Israel. This is clear. I mean, you can't read the Bible without coming to the conclusion that Israel is the center of the earth. Uh, you know, as far as prophetically speaking, absolutely Israel is the center. And the glorious land, the beautiful land, the wonderful land, the promised land, and the most beautiful city or most wonderful city, of course, Jerusalem. So he's going to be powerful toward the glorious land. He will, he will come in and attack Israel. What he did not threaten was Rome in the west. And it's interesting that there's no mention of him going towards the west. 
He's a little horn. He's a little guy. He was really short. Antiochus was only three feet two. No, I'm just kidding. That's a lie. Um, <laughs> that would be funny. No, um, he, it's not that he's short. Rather, little meaning he was a small stature of small power, but then he boasts great things. He becomes powerful. He came from a place of smaller stature. In fact, he was not supposed to be the king. He was not next in line. He was not in line at all. He was not supposed to be the king of the Seleucids. It's kind of interesting how it happened. So he's, um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. But he's, he's made notable, but he comes from that small stature. He gains power through schemes, it says. Verse 23 and 24, a king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. I like the, uh, the S's in there. It just fits, you know, word painting as it is. His power shall be mighty, but not with his own power. Or it's not power that belongs to him. So he gains power, but it's, it's, he's a usurper in a sense. He takes what doesn't really belong to him, and then he exercises that power. It's not, he doesn't own that power, but yet he uses it. So let me tell you a little, little bit about his background. Um, Seleucus IV, he was the king at the time uh, before uh, Antiochus became king. Now, what happened was, that would be his brother. <laughs> and what happened was, there was conflict between them and Rome. And sort of as insurance, they took Antiochus as a prisoner to Rome, sort of, you know, keeping him close at hand, like an insurance policy against the Seleucid Empire, because Rome was sort of the big power in the land at this time. Well, Antiochus worked it out so that his, his, um, his brother, Seleucus IV, his brother actually traded Antiochus for Demetrius, his brother's son, who would have been next in line to be the king. So Antiochus, through some deal-making, works it out where his, his nephew gets traded for him. His nephew goes into, into Rome, and he's now in bonds. He's now, you know, probably treated well. He's a political prisoner, of course. But now Antiochus is back in the land. Then Seleucus IV gets murdered, gets assassinated, but not by Antiochus, by some other guy. Antiochus, he then uses deal-making to take the throne. The rightful heir is in Rome, where he was not, long, not that long ago. In fact, probably in the same room he was in in Rome. So he then takes over, and he uses the help of uh, the king of Pergamum, Eumenes II, and he proclaims himself co-regent with another heir, another Seleucus, who's an infant at the time. Co-regent, right, with an infant. So we know who's really in control, but he does this to try to legitimize his position. So the rightful heir is in Rome. Uh, he doesn't take. He doesn't try to get him back. No, no, no. He declares himself as king with the co-regent. Later, he has this infant murdered. He has the infant killed so that he can take the throne for himself. So did he, or did he not understand sinister schemes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he didn't take the throne like Cyrus. Cyrus came in and he took over the Persian throne. He killed the king and took his spot. Said, "I'm the king." Like, this isn't a sinister scheme. This is just brute force. But this was different. This was, this was all scheming and, and plotting and planning. Later on, when he takes Egypt, he doesn't actually take the capital of Egypt exactly. He sort of makes himself co-heir, co-regent with the king of Egypt, who he's related to, so that the Romans wouldn't get upset and come and, and cause damage to him because of him expanding. So he, he, works, he works the politics. He's a politician. He's a politician. He, he would... He would probably do well in our current political environment. <laughs> so he definitely understands sinister schemes. This is the kind of thing he does. Um, also, toward, it's toward the end of the Seleucid Empire, as it says in verse 23, in the latter time of their kingdom. Uh, Ant Antiochus, he took over at the, towards the end. It was when the Seleucids were beginning to be in decline. Rome, again, is a more dangerous power than the Seleucids are at this point in time. And after his time, shortly after his death, they lost Israel, by 130 BC, not long after he died, they lost all the lands west of the Euphrates. And when the Romans, Romans finally came in in 64 AD and they took over what was left of the crumbling pieces of the Seleucid Empire, it wasn't even an empire anymore. So he really comes in and his kingship is sort of the tipping point to say, and now the empire starts to fall apart after him. So it's in the latter time of their kingdom. That prophecy also fits Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus the fourth. Now let me read to you Daniel 8 verses 9, or I'll just stick at verse 10 here. It says, And it grew up to the host of heaven and cast some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. This probably caught your attention. You're like, angels? Did you somehow attack angels? 
Um, well, if he did, we wouldn't really probably have any sort of historical way to say he did or didn't. I'm not sure how he could. But actually, I think in Daniel, this reference is Jews, not angels. Because in Daniel 8.24... In the same chapter, in the interpretation, it says, His power shall be mighty, but not by his own. Right? He'll destroy fearfully. He shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. The holy people. And in Daniel 12, 3, it says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, the stars, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So it compares people to stars in the same context of the same book. So in this prophecy, the stars of heaven are probably referring to the Jews. Keep in mind, a little horn reached up to heaven, pulled some of the stars down, and trampled them. This is all very symbolic. Um, so probably referring to his attacking and des destroying the Jews, the Jews in particular. So Antiochus Epiphanes, let's look at some more details. His persecution of the Jewish people. He hated the Jews. He literally wanted to destroy either the Jews or at least Judaism. He tried to end the religion of Judaism, which if he was successful would mean that there would be no Christianity. Of course, I think there's good reasons why that couldn't happen. <laughs> but he persecuted the Jewish people. He told them there'd be no more tolerance. Most of the kings would tolerate other religions. It made it easier to get along in your kingdom. It made it easier if you, like Alexander the Great, I want to sacrifice in every temple I find. I want to give honor and obeisance to all the gods so that I can more easily um, you know, gather the people together under my banner. But not... Antiochus. No, he was not interested in any of that. He destroyed copies of the Torah and commanded that they would all be burned. To destroy the Jewish Bible, get rid of it entirely. He forbid people to do what was written in the Torah. He said, you can no longer obey the Torah. He sold the high priest position twice. Twice. Once to a guy named Jason who came in and was basically trying to make the temple and all that happens there more Greek. And then to another guy, Menelaus, and this guy was even worse, so bad that the people revolted against him. And he was putting pagan altars and stuff like that in the temple. So he sold the position. Uh, interestingly, Jason went and bought the position from a sum of money. He was a brother of the current high priest. And he bought it. He bought the position from Antiochus. And then he sent a messenger to pay some money to Antiochus. And that messenger, Menelaus, he paid more and bought the position out from under Jason. It's just, it's just a, a crazy situation of the things that went down. He commanded the Jews specific things. Jews, you are now commanded to eat pork. Yeah, he commanded the Jews to eat pork, to not circumcise their children, to worship and sacrifice to Zeus, or die. He was going to stamp out and destroy the Jewish beliefs and religion and people, uh, their culture, if at all possible. He killed 40,000 Jews in just a two-day period of time. His persecution of the Jewish people was intense, intense. He was the BC Hitler. I mean, he just wanted to ruin, to ruin and destroy. The Jews didn't call him Antiochus Epiphanes. They called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means Antiochus the madman, the crazy man. And he was, he was crazy. There are also specific prophecies that he fulfilled about the temple, specifically about the temple, interestingly. Let's read some of those. Uh, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn, that would be Antiochus, to oppose the daily sacrifices. There were daily sacrifices in the temple. That was the place for daily sacrifice. It didn't happen everywhere. It happened at the temple. And he cast truth to the ground. Um, he did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, another one, holy one, da da da. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So that this is all about the temple. He's going to stop daily sacrifices. There will be like a desolation, some, some, some horrible thing that makes the temple desolate. And then it makes it unclean because in 2,300 days, then it will be cleansed. So there's a prophecy about the stopping of sacrifices, a, a defiling of the sanctuary, and then a, a specific short period of time till it is then cleansed. That's interesting. Also, <clears throat> it says in verse 23, that he shall even rise against the prince of princes. Speaking of that, that his, his exaltation will come against God directly. 
He will directly attack the God of the Jews. He will come against this God. So as I said, specifically about the temple, he sold the high priest position. He did that twice. He plundered the temple. He went to the treasuries, took the money out, trying to use it to finance his other, his other uh, things that he had planned. He did put a stop to the daily sacrifices. We don't know what day this happened. We just know that he did. We don't have a date on it. He slaughtered and commanded to be slaughtered pigs on the holy altar of God in the temple. It was just to spit in the face of the Jewish people and, of course, in the face of God. He even put an icon of Zeus in the temple. And then he had sacrifices to Zeus in the temple. In fact, I'm showing you, so far I've showed you one side of a coin that has his, his face on it. Here's the other side of the coin. When you see this coin from Antiochus, it actually, on the flip side, there's a picture of Zeus... And the coin, it says, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearing victory. The picture is that of Zeus carrying Nike on, um, on his arm there, on his hand. That's Nike he's carrying, and she's the goddess of victory. He, Antiochus connected himself with Zeus. He called himself an incarnation or an appearance of Zeus. Zeus, of course, in these mythological, you know, they would come and go and come and come. And when kings could attach themselves as an incarnation, it helped them gain power. Um, we're not talking here about something like what Jesus said. This is a different kind of mythology thing going on. But this is what he did. And then he, he did what? He said, where God is worshipped in the temple will be the place where Zeus, who's connected to me, in my opinion, will be worshipped. He exalted himself against the prince of princes, against God. Pretty crazy pretty crazy. So he put up altars to Zeus in many places, and he commanded the people of Israel to, uh, to uh, give obeisance to, Ju to Zeus. So there you go. He'll rise even against the prince of princes. And he said to me, verse 14, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And of course, later in verse 26, the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true, therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. In Daniel's time, this would have been hundreds of years into the future. Antiochus was much, much later, of course, so many days in the future. Now, I don't have, uh, I'll, I'll just give you the disclaimer, I don't know the exact 2,300 days, because we don't have enough data right now to put that together. But let me give you what we do have, okay? The Maccabean revol revolt was a result of these, these commands. In fact, Judas Maccabees, this guy right here, that's a photograph, and <clears throat> he was called Judas Maccabees. That's not his last name. Maccabees, he means the hammer. <laughs> He's called Judas the hammer. And so he is related to Pastor Nathan Hamry here at Hosanna, um, obviously. But what Judas did was he was a military leader. You see, his father... Judas's father, he was told, uh, whose name for some reason escapes me right now. It wasn't Matthias, was it? No, it was some Mattathias, something like that. Uh, but his father was a priest of the priestly class, and he was living in a town not too far from, from uh, Jerusalem. He was told, you, at your town, you have to sacrifice to Zeus. And he's like, no way. And one of the men in his town, an Israelite, said, I'll do it. Judas's father stabbed the guy and killed him. And then they thought, now we're in trouble. <laughs> and they were like, uh. So then they fled to the hills and thus began the Maccabean revolt. And they started rebelling against Antiochus and against his laws and against his rules. And this revolt ended up being ultimately successful. Judas, his son, one of his sons, was the military leader of the family. And that's why he's called the Hammer. This started in 167 BC. It involved a lot of guerrilla warfare, all kinds of different tactics because they were totally outnumbered. And so they used all kinds of different guerrilla warfare to, to, to defeat the enemy. You can actually read about this in the book of First and Second Maccabees. These are not biblical books, but they talk about this event. And um, some of it might be somewhat exaggerated, but it's really interesting reading. It really is. And you're just, you get to cheer for, cheer for the good guys, you know. Eventually they retook Israel and they actually made it independent. They ended up losing, he ended up losing the land of Israel. They cleansed the temple, and that happened on December 25th, 164 BC. This is still commemorated, this event of the cleansing of the temple with a Jewish festival by the name of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, yes. And so the festival of lights has to do with the date, the eight days of the cleansing of the temple. 
the time it took to cleanse the temple ritually so that they could begin sacrifices again. So we know that Antiochus stopped sacrifices. We know the date that they began again. Um, the difficulty is counting back 2,300 days from December 25th, 164, and then we go, we're not sure what happened on that day. It's possible that sacrifices stopped on that very day. It's possible that that was the date when uh, the, the previous high priest, you know, who, who was the rightful high priest, before the high priesthood got sold, he was murdered, he was assassinated. It may have been on that very day. But we don't have the exact date of his, his death, we just have a year. And so it makes it hard to tie in the 2300 days. And I don't want to exaggerate anything when it comes to scripture or, or, or anything for that matter. So we don't, we don't know for sure. It's certainly uh, feasible that 2300 days represents the days from the time of the stopping of the sacrifices until they started again. That's quite possible. Then in Daniel 8.25, we get how this guy goes down. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. So if Antiochus died through being assassinated, through a battle, through a rebellion of some kind, um, then this prophecy would fail, but he actually died in 164 BC, not in battle, not assassinated. He just suddenly got ill and died. We're not sure what the illness was. Maybe they didn't know either. He just suddenly got ill and died and the world rejoiced. <laughs> the horrible guy he was. Antiochus fits this like a glove. Nobody else that I'm aware of in history fits this like a glove. But he does. Towards the end of the Seleucid Empire, arises the little horn. Through scheming, he comes to power. He puts an end to the sacrifices. He, ra he raises himself up like he's God, comes against God, comes against the Jewish people, all this stuff, even how he dies. All these little details. There's even more, but we, for sake of time, I'm not giving you every possible thing to say. So by way of review... Daniel 7 and 8 correctly predict the Medo-Persian kingdom and its particulars, Alexander the Great's conquest, and the style of his military victories, the division of his empire into four pieces, the specific region of Antiochus IV, how he would rise, what he would do, how he would die, the desecration and cleansing of the temple. And this is why critics, in response to Daniel, because there's a lot more prophecies we haven't even got to yet in Daniel, this is why they attack the date of Daniel and say it wasn't written until 165, 175 BC. That's what they say. So next week, I'm actually going to, I feel like I've got to do this with, with, with Daniel because like for Ezekiel, they don't attack the date of Ezekiel. They just say it wasn't fulfilled, which is silly when you look at the passage. Um, with Daniel, they attack the date. So they agree that these do correctly predict these specific events. And they go, and that's proof it was written in the time of the Maccabean revolt. So we're going to tackle that next week. Uh, I won't spend the whole week on it. It won't take a whole service to tackle that. So we'll probably also look at some other prophecies of Daniel. Maybe Daniel 9. That's what I'm looking at doing uh, in the 70 weeks prophecy, which is pretty nifty if you ask me. And, um, and that, even if he wrote in 175 BC, he couldn't have predicted, um, you know, through human means, the stuff that was going to happen 200 years later. <laughs> so, so that's pretty exciting. Um, all right. Well, that's it for today. So let's, uh, let's pray. Thank you guys for being patient. And I will put this stuff up on YouTube. I will put the PowerPoints up there so you could always review it some other time. You can link a friend to it as well. Um, if I were you, as we go through this prophecy thing, I would consider taking just one or two of these prophecies, not all of them, one or two that you go, I really like that one. And listen to it once or twice, three, maybe even four times. Get it sort of in your pocket where you can restate the main points to a friend on the street. So you just got one or two prophecies because that will be your, your, your crowbar that opens the door to then just sharing the gospel of Jesus with them. Um, so I, I really like that. I like they just, one or two, you, you're not going to know it all. Uh, I have to study to be able to deliver this stuff. You know, I don't just have it off the cuff. Um, I, have, I have Ezekiel 26 off the cuff because I've spent the time to try to get it. I've got Psalm 22 off the cuff. Here's the two that I try to have ready, ready to go. You know, I could open the Bible and just say, hey, look at this. Um, but uh, so I recommend you do that. Pick one or two of the, the things that we're going through and have that ready for whoever you share with. And we'll just be that better equipped. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for the fact 
that you've given us reason to believe that you have spoken, that we look and we say, wow, um, I don't know how to explain that except that you've spoken. And then your word takes this place in our hearts and in our minds as the truth of God communicated wonderfully to us in such beautiful and amazing ways. Lord, we can't wait till we get to the prophecies about Jesus. Till we get to um, even more evidence, the unity of the Bible, the archaeology and all that kind of fun stuff. It's just, it's amazing, Lord. So we pray that we just be equipped and our confidence would be strong in your holy word and we would be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy because we have put on the belt of truth. In Jesus' name, amen.